1 Samuel 12 and 1. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed, and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. Okay. It's like, have I ever done you wrong? Have I ever done anything to purposely do anything wrong to you? No, you haven't. He's like, okay, then trust what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> it's interesting how Samuel had addressed the people about his age during Saul's coronation. Now, why would he do that? He said, I'm getting old. And Saul's stepping in. It's kind of like, guys, it's kind of like, listen, Saul's coming in and I'm going out. It's like, evaluate your scenario here. I'm limited. Saul's fresh. <laughs> Saul has been distinguished as king while Samuel asked the people to review him to see if they could detect any flaws or morality issues within his life. Have I wronged you, he asked. Have I taken anything from you? And their answer, their collective answer was no. You hadn't done anything wrong. So, you know, why did Samuel ask the people to review him like this? Why did he say, look for any flaws in me? Um, well, he's about to give them a lot of heavy information to consider, and he wants to make sure they're going to receive it. He wants to make sure they're really going to listen to him. It's like, you really analyze me. If you find any reason not to listen to me, bring it up now. Because if I did wrong in front of everybody, I want to fix it so that we can get on with that and move past it. And then I've got things to tell you I really need you to hear. Okay? Now, this is the, the accountability, the responsibility of a minister. And I feel that with Samuel here. I feel it. Because I've got to make sure I haven't wronged any of you. Sometimes some of you have come in to me and said, Ray, um, I want to talk to you about something, and we'll hash it out and figure it out. And, and if I was off, then I'm sorry, and we'll, we'll make it right. That's kind of what he's doing. He wants you to listen. Just like me, I want you to listen. I'll be with the same with Samuel. If I ever wronged you, tell me. Maybe I don't know that I did it, so say something. I want you to trust what I'm saying. So he's about to give them some information. He wants them to receive that. He wants to establish his life as one of being trustworthy so that they will trust what he's about to tell them. Guys, if you don't trust your ministers, are you going to listen to them? No. You're going to leave and you're going to go somewhere else. But let's first realize that Samuel had to live his entire life with integrity, with oneness. He did not flip-flop around. He wasn't bad one year and then good another year and then in and out. He said, from the time I was a child until now, I'm gray and I'm old. He's showing them, I've been at this a long time. And there's a lot of time in there to find a flaw in somebody. Well, remember 50 years ago when you went and did this, and you know, but he never did. He's like, guys, I put in all this work to build relationship with you all this time. Do you have anything against me at all? And they're like, no. I'm like, whoo, Samuel, man, you're awesome. Because if you knew me over 20 years ago or so, you'd hate me. I was not a good guy. I was not a good guy at all. So Samuel has a good testimony. And that's why it's important for you to have a testimony, a good story about your life, because you want to be able to validate what you're saying to people when you tell them about the Lord. So, Samuel never ran with the crowd. He never sided with whatever was popular just so he could fit in. He chose, for the entirety of his life, he chose the righteousness of God and stayed there. Because now he gets to cash in on it. Now he gets to tell people this heavy news coming, and he had to spend his whole life earning the right 
to say what he's about to say. You ever wonder if your life has any purpose sometimes? Well, what's it all for? Nobody's paying attention to me anyway. You live righteously. You live right. Don't slip. Don't mess up. I know we do sometimes, but if you do, make it right with people and move on because you'll come to a point where you stand before people and say, look, I have something to say to you, and you're going to want them to listen. You see what Samuel's doing here? He's, he's trying to demonstrate a godly standard in his life. And so it's, it's very hard to maintain this level of integrity that Samuel has done because on one hand, you're tempted to give in and join up with your friends. Hey, Ray, come on, let's go out tonight. Let's go to that bar over here and let's do this. And I'm like, I can't. And often I'm the one that doesn't get to go. And part of me says, I wish I could do it, but I have a standard to maintain, I, even for them. Even for my wife, for everybody, my family, I have to show them. There's going to be a lot of times you get counted out because you want to live holy, set apart unto God. There's going to be those times. You look like the nerd. You're the dork. You're the odd guy out. You're the black sheep, all that stuff. Hey, take it as honor. Take it as honor. This is what holiness is. Set apart. I'm not like y'all. I'm saving myself for the Lord. There's going to come a time the people who are not listening to you finally will. And you will have had to have earned that spot. Wow. That's a lot. Who Samuel spent decades. He's an old man now. Decades. Years of maintaining a serious discipline for living right on, before the Lord. Just so that he can tell the people what he's about to say. This is a long time. A very hard work. Man, Ray, you're spending a lot of time talking about this part. I know. Because I'm having to do it. And you should be too. And it's very important that we do this. So he's proven to them, okay, you've trusted me in the past. Now trust what I'm about to tell you for the future. 1 Samuel 12 and 6. Then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still. <laughs> That's a lot of asking people today. Stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did for you, which he did to you and your fathers, when Jacob had gone to, into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, <laughs> hint, hint, America, and when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them. Guys, do you see this? This right here that I just read, please look at what I just read. It is in the Bible. I didn't write it. The Lord wrote it. When they forgot the Lord their God, He sold them. God does that. My God would never do that. The God you made up wouldn't do it. The God of the Bible says right here, He sold them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Why would God do such a thing as that? Uh, 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 uh. Why would we forget the Lord God? That's the question. You forget the Lord your God, I'm going to live my life my way. Forget it, God. I've got my own way to go about things. He's, he'll sell you. He, he, he can, and he's done it. And I always like to say this. If the Lord God would do this to his own people, Israel, what do us Gentiles think he'd do? Do we feel like we're better? We're not, we're not first to the Jew first, okay? The blessings hit them first. I'm just glad I'm blessed to be uh, grafted into that. But if he would do this to his own people, what do you think he would do to us? He'd do it too. He sold them to their enemies. Now, what does it sound like Samuel's trying to do here? When he says, and when they forgot the Lord their God. Isn't that kind of a jab in the ribs <laughs> to where Israel was at right now? It's like, remember those guys back then when they forgot God? Remember what he did? He sold them. <clears throat> Get it? It's like, hello, people, that's what you're doing now. What do you think's about to happen to you? You see why he established the trustworthiness thing up front, right? 
Guess what he was about to tell him was heavy. <laughs> Israel told God, no. You tell your kids to do something. No. Does that just burn you up? <laughs> I mean, it does. What do you think it's doing to God? They told him, no, we reject you. We want a king to rule over us. Can you imagine the king of all kings saying, I'm going to do everything for you. And he's, he's got his royal attire on. And they go, no, we want a king. Right. What? Are you kidding? And so Samuel asks if he's trustworthy. They say yes. And so he tells them what happened when Israel forgot about God. They were handed to their enemies and into war. Samuel's trying to get the Israelites to reflect back to what has already happened to them in the past so that they can be warned about their future. This already went down before. It's coming back if you don't watch it. Now, as we read in the previous chapter, Saul led Israel in their first military victory, in, their first, in his first military battle, and everybody got excited about Paul, uh, Saul. But now the question is, would the people see that the victory was evidence that it was God's power that brought them that victory? Or would they see this as King Saul's achievement? Who won? Because God enabled Saul to win or was it Saul's power that caused this victory? The people, I don't think, are seeing this yet. I don't think they're recognizing that. Would the people view this as a victory to turn back to glorifying God or would they see it as a human victory that was devoid of God's influence. Oh no, Saul pulled this off. You would think it would at least start an argument. Some people would say, no, I think God did that. I don't see that argument happening here. But anyway, this is quite a moment here because Samuel wants the people to get a fresh perspective of God's sovereignty. If you forget about him, if you walk away from him, he can and will do this. He'll turn you over to the enemies. He wants them to understand the need to worship and praise God as the source of their blessings. Guys, we just did that this morning. We worship God for the source of our blessings. You didn't say, praise my 401k, did you? You didn't say, praise my retirement or thank God for my bank account or, or even praise God for this government that, that, that I elected into office because you know what? That party can flip any time. It can elect the other way. Are you going to be happy this four years and depressed the next four years if your guy doesn't make it in office? Or does the Lord hold you up in joy no matter what? Who are you giving your glory to, really? So Samuel just literally reminded them that it was the Lord, not Saul, who brought them out of Egypt and redeemed them back to the land of their own that they were standing on. He said, you, you saw that. He was talking about where, where you're standing right now, this land, that you, the home that you have. God brought up some guys to get you out of Egypt, to get you here. That's why you're even here. It's like, did you forget about him, the Lord? Did you forget? God did all this. Israel had forgotten what all it took and who it took to get them to the very land that they were standing on, the very place they call home. Now Samuel is reminding them of when God, the king that they already had, was their provider and their protector. Remember they said, we want a king that will protect and provide. Well, you've got one. No, 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 no. We want, another. We want a guy. <sighs> you ever do something great for your kids and they didn't care? Don't say it if you did, because some of those kids are in the room. <laughs> All the parents with kids in the room are going, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> but it happens. And so Samuel reminded them that they were handed over to the Philistines. Now, why in the world would God ever hand a people over to their enemies? You ever hear people say, well, that can't happen in America. 9-11, it happened. Well, that can't happen in America. It's happening right now. And I'm still hearing, well, what you think is coming can't happen in America. I'm like, hello. Of course it can. We're not superior to everybody else like we think we are sometimes. You know, I, I hear that from people when I travel the world. You Americans think you're better than everybody. And uh, that hurts when I hear that. Because on one hand, we don't. On the other hand, we do. God will do this. He will hand you over to your enemy. America, we need to repent and get right with the Lord. 
Why in the world would God hand people over to their enemies? And most people hearing me, some people hearing me right now are thinking that doesn't sound like the God I serve. Well, don't make up a God that fits your taste. Right. Read the one in the Bible. Learn who he says he is. You need to get to know the God of Israel. And when you talk about God, don't just say God. Right. Specify. Call him by name. Yahweh, the God of Israel. Tell people which God you serve. Everybody says, God, tell them which God. You've got to show people that you follow a specific God who outlines who he says he is in his word so that you can know who he is and what he expects of you so that we can get in line with him. It's very important. Now, God literally hands his people over to their enemies. But why? Why would God do that? To get them to do what Samuel says next in 1 Samuel 12, 10. Look what the people do. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned. That's why God does that. That's why he hands us over to our enemies to get us to say what they just said. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now, deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. That's why he does this. Well, that was for Israel, Ray. In the context, that was for Israel. I know. But why did he write down what happened between him and Israel? So that you and I could read this and see and understand what's going on, how he expects us to behave. Cry out to the Lord and say, we have sinned. I have sinned, God. Friend, let me ask you, are you going through a tough time? Have you been handed over to your enemies? You know what you ought to do? 1 Samuel 12, 10. That's what you ought to do. Cry out to the Lord and say, I have sinned. I hope that, okay, if you're listening to me on the radio, you're sitting in your car, you're driving, and you kind of have me on in the background. Hello, ding, 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 ding. I'm getting your attention. What you need to do is say, Lord, I have sinned. If you didn't hear anything I said, hear that. <laughs> the reason I say that is it works for me. I hear pastors do that, and I go, oh, <laughs> what's he saying? And I turn it up. Listen to this. We have sinned. Those of you who might be hearing me right now that think God only exists just to serve you and shower you with blessing all the time, it says right here in 1 Samuel 12 that God hands his own people over to his enemies when they turn their backs on him. Why? To get them to cry out to him, to confess, we have sinned. We have sinned. Ray, you're being awful harsh on this subject because sin is harsher than I could ever be. Sin is rough. It took a crucifixion. It was barbaric to do away with it. Sin is harsh. It's rough. Yeah, I'm going to get hard on this subject. You bet. We have sinned. And that's why God would hand his own people over to their enemies when they forget and turn on him. In fact, like I said, if the, God would hand, if the God of Israel would hand the Israelites over to the enemies, what do you think he'd do to us Gentiles? Do you honestly believe he'd do this to the Israelites? But us Gentiles are untouchable for some reason. No. Now, this is not to discount the love and mercy and grace that God offers us, because he does. He does love us. And he does offer a love that you could never experience but through him. But when it comes to people turning from him and shaking their fist in his face after all the good things he's done for them and telling God no, then God has to bring in a little disciplinary action. He has to do that. You can choose your own sin, but you never get to choose the consequences that come along with it. That's the bummer about the whole thing. Well, I want to sin. Well, you better weigh out the consequences first because you don't know what they're going to be. Again, parents, man, you're making this rough on me, Ray. Well, my parents aren't in here, so I'm going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> parents, when your own children tell you no and they shake their fist in defiance at you, let's say over cleaning up their room, what do you do? You implement some disciplinary action, don't you? And that changes the attitude pretty quick. 
You don't do that because you hate them. You do it because you love them, right? Your love is not any less just because you implement discipline. Doesn't mean I hate you now. You love them. You love them enough to teach them that you are the one with authority, not them. You teach them that you are the provider, not them. You teach them that you have the wisdom to make the right decisions, not them, because it's for their safety and their provision. You are the protector. You are the parent, not them. And you know what's good for them, even though they don't know it themselves. How many of you have ever had your own parents? I'm going to put you all in the hot seat then. How many of you have had your own parents tell you what's best for you? You didn't like it, went out and did it anyway, and found out they were right. Yeah. We are blessed enough to have a son who came and told us one time, you were right. I don't know if you all even said thank you about it. I don't know if you've all had that, but we have. And it was good to hear. So God knows better than we do by far. And sometimes he has to get tough with us to get through our hard head every time we start thinking we know better than he does. I praise God for that when he gets tough with me because he knows what's good for me when I don't. And so the people turn back to God. They cry out in confession and they said, we are sinners, save us. And look how God responds to a cry like this in 1 Samuel 12, 11. He's still talking. He says, and the Lord sent Jeroboam, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel and delivered you out of the hands of your out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt in safety okay now this is the god that i serve i don't know about the god you serve here's the one i follow right here um when you repent and turn back to him with confession lord god i have sinned when you turn back in confession then god's savior steps in and gives you peace that's the god i serve and any savior that's capable of doing this, he has to be someone who has the power to defeat your enemies so that you can be delivered from your enemies. To be delivered from an enemy, your savior has to be stronger. That's pretty obvious. They just saw this play out with Saul, but they want it to be Saul, but they said, no, the Lord has done much bigger things than that, though. But think about it. You can't have safety from an enemy unless your savior has the power that's greater than that enemy. Now, I want you to take notice of the three key words that should be underlined here. There should be three. I know. I'm sorry. I didn't see them sent underlined earlier. So delivered in safety, but sent didn't get. And you dwelt in safety. Okay. Well, sent. The word yeah. sent before Jeroboam should be underlined. Okay. So those are three key words in verse 11. And I want you to take your Bibles or your, your digital iPad things or whatever you can. And I want you to underline in verse 11. 11. I want you to highlight or underline sent, delivered, and safety. Whatever you need to do, however your method is. Sent, delivered, and safety. Sent, delivered, and safety. And because from now on, anytime you open up your Bible and you come anywhere near 1 Samuel 12, so you're flipping and, you, it, and it goes by and you see it, I want you to see sent, delivered, and safety. Those are very important terms that we have here before us. I want you to always see those three words. I want them to jump off the page at you. Imagine years from now, you're, you're going through your Bible and you come across this and you've got sent, delivered, and safety. Oh yeah, I remember Ray talking about that. Well, I want you to remember the gospel more than you remember me. Sent, delivered, and safety. Because the Lord sent us a deliverer who gave us safety. That's why I want you to see the gospel. You got these people that say, oh, I'm a New Testament Christian. Hey, there's the gospel in the Old Testament right here. Sent, delivered, and safety. All in one, one spot right there. And the Lord does that in response to a repentant cry of confession. Amen. There's the gospel in 1 Samuel 12. I'm always looking for that little... That red thread through the Bible right there. There it is. Okay. That is the God I serve. And so the people cried out, we sinned. God sent them a deliverer to bring them into safety. That's our God. I think Samuel's trying to give them the indication. This, can, this whole Saul thing can go one of two ways. He can either be a false God you serve wrongly and get you in trouble. Or he could end up being the guy that saves you. It's your choice. Ooh. Look at that. Okay, so Samuel continues speaking to the people in 1 Samuel 12 and 12. 
He said, and when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now, therefore, here's the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you here, here's the terms. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Well, looks like we have a choice to make, don't we? So, okay, they have been warned. Now, like it or not, agree with it or not, listen to it or not, the warning was issued is basically what Samuel's getting at. Take it or leave it, I told you. He already set up, have I done you wrong? No, you haven't. Okay, then hear what I'm saying. It's going to be true. Samuel just put the ball in their court. He had left it up to them to decide how this is all going to turn out from here on out. It's now in your hands what you do with it. The choice is yours. It's yours. All up to you. It's going to go one or two ways. It's either going to go up or it's going to go down. Now, Samuel was very, very detailed, and he was very descriptive. He reminded them of their long-running track record with God of all the times that God stepped in and did something for them and saved them. Even the recent situation with the Ammonites when King Nahash showed up. He talks about all the times he saved them time and time again. But then suddenly Samuel tells them, but this time you said no. God saved you, God saved you, God saved you, God saved you, God saved you. And now you said no. He's kind of getting them to think, what do you think is the logical outcome to all this? If you go that way. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. <laughs> Friends, they said a king shall reign over us when the Lord was your king. Friends, there's not enough room for two kings. Every nation has just one king only. One king for a nation. You can't have a supreme leader if there's more than one. Somebody has to be above all and only one. But Israel rejected God as king to replace him with Saul. And now God had more than proven himself, hadn't he? For centuries he's proven himself through a long history of fighting for them. A totally successful history of victories. Now with God, they always won. And they decide to go with Saul? With God, you always had it. And you pick Saul? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. If you had to undergo major surgery, okay, and you had two doctors to choose from, one doctor had a 100% success rate with a long bit of uh, period of history and experience, but the other doctor had never done anything, and nobody knows him yet, and he's never done anything. Which doctor would you pick to operate on you? The one that's got the track record. The one that's done well. I'm sorry for the new guy, but you haven't shown me anything yet. <laughs> I mean, it's so obvious, it's ridiculous. But that's what Israel had just done. They chose the unknown guy, unknown guy with no history and rejected the God who specifically chose them out of all the rest of the entire world. And he gave them everything, including the land they live on. He said, here, take it. Live long and prosper. Take this land, it's yours. And they picked Saul. Now, now I know I just quoted a Mr. Spock at you from Star Trek, but I want you to know that Leonard Nimoy, the actor, he's Jewish, okay? So, there was, yeah. Now, Israel had dumped the Lord for this guy named Saul nobody knew anything about, but one victory, just one victory with the Ammonites, and bam, he's, at, he's our king. We'll take him. And don't forget, it was the Lord who enabled Saul in the first place to win because the Lord is setting up Israel for a choice of judgment. He's giving them a choice. Here's your choice. Pick me, pick him. What happens to you from that decision is going to be dependent on how you, how you decide. Pretty easy. 
So that's why Samuel gives them a choice in verse 14. Obey the Lord, and the king will be good. You'll follow. It'll be fine. But disobey the Lord, and he'll be against you. And yes, folks, the Lord sometimes does turn his hand against his own people. We are the sinner. That's one thing we have to remember. Here's the way it works, guys. God is God, and we are not. We are the sinner, and God is not the sinner. We are not so good and so glorious that God is required to always just bless us. It doesn't work that way. And so just like with your own children, you love them with all your heart, but sometimes they need good discipline, and as their parent, it's up to you to administer it. And they're probably going to hate you for it. Why are you doing this to me? Uh, I know better than you. That's why. God's going to set them up for this same decision here. It's up to the Israelites to decide. Samuel is getting old. He's not going to be around much longer as an instrument of God's grace as a voice of reason. You think Samuel is there to speak to the people, to speak reasonable to them. Guys, here's what the Lord offers you. I'm gray. I'm old. I'm about to be out of here. And all you've got from here is Saul. You better make a good choice. You hear him? It's like, I'm off to the ultimate retirement. You better make good decisions now. Oh, man. 1 Samuel 12 and 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Wow. Imagine if I did that. Call upon rain and it showed up. And it was rough and it was chaotic. I mean, to see a guy that could do that, that would get your attention. That would put the fear of the Lord in you. There was a time I spoke the other day and I made a big point and a horn blew in the parking lot. And everybody went, whoa, but what if it was thunder? I'm going to call on two hurricanes. No. <laughs> Don't go there, Ray. <laughs> I am kind of glad it veered up. It's going to go like east. Anyway, let, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Well, during the time of the wheat harvest, it said, it's, it's always important to take notice of time stamps. When the Bible gives you time stamps, it's there for a reason. Pay attention to it. It said it was the time of the wheat harvest. Now, there was never thunder and rain at this time of year. That's the time of the year for that part of, in that time in Israel. They didn't have thunder and rain like that. It never happened that time of the year in that month. And so for Samuel to call down thunder and rain... And something that never shows up this time of year actually showed up and happened. That is quite a validation of what Samuel just said. First, he said, have I wronged you? Re review me. Did I ever do anything wrong? No, you haven't. He gives them the word. They listen. They now know their choice. And he goes, and now to further validate it, God's going to get behind it. And here comes this rain and thunder that never shows up. Bam, there it is. You think the people are listening now? I think I would be. I think I would be. God is confirming he's behind this warning. And I'm sure this is not quite the coronation party that Saul was looking for. <laughs> this is my coronation, man. I'm here. I'm sure his cup of wine got diluted with rainwater. It's like, well, throw that out. Might as well not even drink it now. I mean, can you see how the, you talk about getting rain on your parade? This happened. Now, remember previously, the people said that if anybody questioned Saul's rule, we'll kill him. They wanted Saul so bad, if anybody questioned it, kill him. And so Samuel needed a powerful sign. He didn't want it to make it look like he was questioning Saul's authority. God, get behind this. And he called down rain and it showed up. It authenticated the warning. Most people, and here's what's sad. Most people today, they disregard what ministers say. Ministers will stand at the pulpit and talk and talk. I've got a zillion friends out there who have not once listened to me preach, who've never one time showed up to hear me, not even the podcast. And I'm wondering, I'm trying with everything I can to get through to people, and they just won't listen. But you ever notice that most people disregard what a minister says until God authenticates it? And now it gets personal. And now, oh, I should. 
I really should have been listening to you. I like what's going on here. This is good because they really listened. It got real with the people, especially when it drove them to their knees. I was talking to a pastor the other day. He was talking to me. He goes, Ray, I remember the, the, when you were here a couple months ago and you gave this invitation and there were people that came up wanting to give their life to the Lord, not just, oh, I'm here to give my life. They were shaken and they were crying, men and women. There's actually more men than women. And they had tears running down their face and they were just, they were just like this. They were just, they were like, I'm sorry. It drove them to their knees. Amen. We need more of that. And when God authenticates it, it's not just me talking. God authenticated the message in those people. And it got them to come forward and give their life to Christ. It got real. And that's what God was doing with the Israelites. He was trying to get it real with them. And this wasn't just an authentication of his warning, but it was also an authentication of his judgment that would come if they don't do right. Whew. Friends, man, even the friends of mine I was just referring to, you're thinking, oh, Ray, he's talking about me. I'm talking about you because you need to be saved. Well, I'm saved already. Then how come you're not following the Lord? Doing the things that he loves. God, God bring them. 1 Samuel 12 and 19. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Wow, look at that. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet... Do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside for when you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. Golly, you can make a whole sermon out of this one segment right here. In fact, I will. We're going to be here another hour. No. <laughs> for they are nothing, for the Lord will not forsake his people you got to underline something else. There it is right there. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Why? Because, uh, is it based on you? No. For his great name's sake. It's based on him. It's not based on you. Well, I'll lose salvation if I... No, it's not based on you. The Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and, right, and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Always got to put the warning right at the end of it. Right. What's fascinating here is that the people actually realized they did wrong in asking for a king. And it took all this to get them to realize it. It took a storm. It took this. It took all the. It took Samuel living a whole life, decades of integrity and crash and boom lightning and all this stuff to get the people to realize we messed up. Do you realize that you could just go ahead and get confess in confession mode and get on your knees now without waiting for all the bad stuff to happen? Do you realize we could just go ahead and do that now? Why should it take this much? To get us to realize we sinned, why can't we just get before the Lord now? Right now, there's a lot of crazy things going on in the world. Why? Because the world's sinful. God has to push all this big stuff. He's trying to get people's attention. I'm your king. I'm your provider. Not your money, not your government, gold, guns, government, all the three G's. It's not your God. I am. Why can't people just see that? There's a time when I didn't, but I'm thankful I know now. We could just get on our knees now before it gets that bad. And so they asked Samuel to pray for their forgiveness. I think that's so wonderful. Pray for us. 
And so even after doing all this wicked stuff, all this terrible stuff, even after they rejected God, you ever been rejected? You ever been the guy that was either picked last for the soccer team or not picked at all? <laughs> I've been there. It's a long time ago, sixth grade in PE. I, for, I totally remember it. But they didn't pick me for some reason. They, nobody wanted me. I'm like, well, fine. I just won't even play at all. Okay, we'll take you. Well, sounds like you really want me, you know. You've been there. The outcast, the, the person nobody wanted. Well, even after they did that to God, we don't want you, God. Even after all that, God still offered them a fresh slate. A chance to refresh, a chance to do it right. Isn't that good? That even though we do that to the Lord, He still says, guess what? I hear your confession. Let's start over. When people do me wrong... I want to hate them for the rest of my life. Here I am all this time later in sixth grade. I still remember the guys that wouldn't pick me. <laughs> I forgave them. Uh, did you right? Yeah. <laughs> then why'd you bring it up? For an example, I forgave them. As a matter of fact, I still know them. God offered them a fresh slate, a chance to start over again. That's so good. He's like, I know you did wicked. I know you did wrong. Here's the warning. Here's your choice. But because of their confession, he goes, let's start over. From here out, follow me. Let's start again. Samuel said, you've done terribly bad up to now, but here's your chance to make it right. God, that's good. Here's the gospel again. Here's your chance to get it right. He said, don't turn from following God. Can you see how they, the Israelites have been offered grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. They were offered grace. And Samuel said to the people that God would bless them in spite of the bad things they've done. If they would just repent and stay there. Are you all hearing me? Stay there. Well, I repented once a long time ago. Why are you still walking like the devil? Why are you still doing those bad things? Pick a side, get on it, and stay there. If you're going to follow God, follow God and stay there. Don't flip-flop. Build up a relationship of integrity that will earn people's ear when it's time for you to tell them the gospel so that they will trust you. They're getting grace. God is being very gracious to them. This is a very incredible moment. You've sinned greatly against me, but you can still turn back to me. Guys, do we not serve a great God? I say we do. That even after all this, He gives them a chance to do it again. This same God that's talking to the Israelites here in 1 Samuel 12 is the same God that talks to you when you pray. The same one. Oh, that was a long time ago. Same God. That's how he sees us. He says, if you've, you've sinned, yeah, you've messed up, but you know what? Confess, repent, turn back to me, serve me, believe in me, and trust in me, and I will be glad to call you my own. I will call you my own. Aren't you glad to know that you are called by God? If you've given your life to Jesus, he calls you his, you're mine. You see those kids throwing tantrums in the grocery store, and they're not yours? <laughs> you want to wring their neck, but you can't, because they're not yours. What happens if your kid does it? Huh, you're mine. <laughs> it's very different. But also the blessing, too. You want to bless a child? Bless your own kids. Bless your kids. You can be nice to the other kids, but your own kids get the best of you, because they're yours. God sees you as his own. You get the best of what God has to offer because you belong to him. He calls you his own. That's very encouraging. Now, the coin of encouragement has two sides to it. One side is blessing, but the other side is judgment. Coins always have two sides. The tails side of the coin. We heard the blessing side, but the tails side of the coin is that if they do not follow the Lord, verse 25 he says, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. All of you. That's the tail side. It's all encouragement. Though judgment is encouragement to do right. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
And the blessing is also encouragement to do right. You got to have both. So that's why he closed up at the end in verse 25. If you do wrong, you're going to be swept away, both you and your king. Now that's a harsh judgment. But what grace it was for God to offer them the blessing of walking forward if they would just choose to do it. To follow God. It's nice they have a choice. Did you know that freedom, freedom is not getting to do anything you want. Freedom is having a choice. It's a choice. It's having a choice. But it's a harsh judgment he offered. But what grace that they even have a choice. Friends, I want you to know that God offers you the same deal that he offered the Israelites. Although you have done wicked things, we have all done wicked things because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all committed acts of sin. God offers you a refresh point. You have a computer that gets buggy and you reboot it. Blah, 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 do it back around. Etch a sketch, shake it, okay, clear all that mess. God offers you that. A refresh, a reboot. He has a new offer for you, which is this. Although your past is what it is, and although what you've done is what you've done, though your past is tainted, God offers you a new future if you will devote yourself to following Him. Doesn't matter what you did. I've had people come here and say, you probably wouldn't like me in your church. I said, why? Well, I used to do this, or I used to be this, and I told them, I don't care. I care where you're going, not where you've been. The Lord offers the same to you. If you will respond to his offer of grace to follow him in blessing, then it could all be yours. But if you do not, you choose not to follow the Lord and you want to live, you don't want to follow the Lord and live life in his prescribed way, then all you can expect for your future is judgment. Regardless of how they heard him or did not hear him, I want you to notice that he said that he said, he said this. He said, I will stay here and I will pray for you because it would be a sin if I didn't. Right. Did you catch that? Yes. When you're telling people the gospel, I don't, I don't like it. Or they say, yeah, I want it. Whichever way, you make sure they know you're praying for them. And don't stop. Don't cease praying for them. He prayed for the people to respond to his call to repentance, to turn back to God so that they could expect God's blessing. And so that's what I will do for you too, here today. I will maintain prayer as I do for many to receive God's offer of grace through Jesus Christ because it would be a sin for me not to pray for you to receive that. Even if you don't like the warning I gave you today, for those of you that heard me, I don't like the sound of that ray. I don't believe in a God that does that. Even still, I will still pray for you. Just remember, you're not just hearing warning, but also promise. Judgment is promised to happen if you choose in your own free will not to follow God. But salvation is a promise too. I want to show you them real quick. Two verses real fast that show you this. Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we sin willfully, means you want it, i got to have it, it's my life, I'm going to do it, no God, it's my way. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. That's the bad side of the coin, the tail side, but here's the other side. Romans 10, 9, that if, if you confess, that means it's dependent on you if you do it, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will probably be saved. I get a reaction every time I do that, and I love it. Because that's not what it says. It doesn't say you'll probably be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say your chances are good. What does it say? You will. Promise of God. Promise of God. Bank on it. You will be saved. Now, I know that in the context of the story is dealing with the Israelites, and that was for them. But I want us to understand that we have all been given a very similar offer as a choice to follow or to reject the Lord. And just like Israel was offered a choice, how you choose is going to determine your future. Are you going to realize that you're a sinner, or do you think you're still good? Well, I'm a good person. No, the Bible says no one's good. That's why we need a Savior. 
How much does it take? Does it take a massive storm? Does it take more friction, more trouble, more trial? How much does it take before you'll just say, you know what, I need to get on my knees and confess my sin to the Lord. You can just do it now. You don't have to wait for it to get worse. I, like Israel was offered, you can choose your future. And I think that the best, most loving part of God's offer comes in the fact that he knows Israel's sin, and even though they did wickedly, he still offered them salvation anyway. He still offered. And so if you're hearing me today, and if what you're hearing angers you, because a lot of people get upset when they hear the gospel, then let me say what Samuel said. Consider what great things he has done for you. Consider those good things that he's done for you. What good thing is God for me? He's given you a life to live. Yeah, but my life's been terrible. Then let God give you a new life. I hear that from people all the time. My life's terrible. You don't understand, Ray. Well, you don't understand either. God wants to give you a new one. A whole new life. Let God give you a new life. It'll never be like the one you had before. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, which means look, check this out. All things have become new. New. You tired of your old life? Good. Give it to Jesus. Amen. He'll give you another one. <laughs> I don't want my old life back. I'm done. I ain't going back. Guys, that's a promise of God. Take him up on it. Now, I'm proclaiming the truth of God's word again. Uh, uh, the, the truth of God's word to you. And so I'm going to ask, I'm going to do like Samuel did. And I ask you, whom have I cheated? I'm, for those of you on the radio that can't see what's going on, I'm asking my congregation, did I cheat you? I don't see anybody shaking Yes. Well, Ray, if you really did cheat us, we're not going to say here. Yes, you better say here. Samuel put himself up for that. If I did you wrong, we'll get it right. Have I done you any wrong here? If your answer is no, you haven't wronged us, then let the conduct of my life and the Lord himself serve as witness to you that what I am saying is true, that in Jesus Christ there is the offer of a totally new life for you if you'll follow him and not after other things. And even if you've done sinful, terrible things up until today, God offers you salvation despite whatever you've done in the past. 2 Corinthians 6.2 Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I'll think about it for later, Ray. Scripture says right now, now that you're hearing it, now is your time. Israel had forgotten what it took, who it took to get them to the land that they call home, who protected them from those who tried to take it all away. Today, America has also forgotten the source of its blessing. Samuel wanted Israel to understand the need for worshiping and praising the Lord as the source of their blessing. Look at verse 11 where it says, sent Israel's saviors. It said the Lord delivered Israel from their enemies, and it says the Lord gave them safety. Sent, delivered, and safety. I had you underline or whatever you did, highlight them. And I want to show you in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, delivered, but have everlasting life. Safety. Amen. Sent delivered safety the gospel in first samuel 12 does that sound like a good gift yeah. especially when you consider we were sinners i want you to realize that a nation can only have one king and that's why israel rejected god for saul your life can only have one king one it's either the lord or it's whatever false god you've chosen to worship and so you have to make a choice are you going to let that king have you or will you put your trust in Jesus? But there is not room for two. There's just room for one. Ladies, is it okay for your man to have more than one woman? Men, is it okay for the ladies to have more than one man? No. I'm getting some uh-uh looks in here right now. <laughs> There's only room for one. There can only be one ruler in your life. And if it's not Jesus, then you're bowing to a different king. 
Don't bow to a different king. Remember what Samuel said? Fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still be, if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Give it to Jesus Christ. You are not worthless. You are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you.